Last week we heard the story of Naaman, the great military leader of Aram who had contracted leprosy. And Naaman had a servant, a young girl that his army had captured in Israel and then brought back to Aram to work as a slave in his home. And in our word last week, we spoke of the extraordinary grace of this young girl that despite her abuse, despite her abduction, that she pointed the way to healing and she gave hope in the midst of darkness. Now today we pick up that story as Naaman heads to Israel to go and look for the prophet Elisha, the one that the young girl had spoken of, the man who could potentially heal him from his leprosy. Now, because Naaman is a big shot, his king gives him a letter of introduction, a common practice of the day, gives him lots of money and 10 sets of fancy clothes, which is interesting, to take with him to the king of Israel. Now, it turns out that the king of Aram's letter was a little clumsy because he wrote something like this. He said, "Uh, this is my servant Naaman, please cure him of leprosy. But everyone knew that leprosy was incurable. So when the king of Israel gets the letter, he's indignant because he goes, what does the guy think? Does he think I'm God? Is he trying to pick a fight with me? I mean, how am I supposed to cure the guy? And if I don't, what's he going to do to me? And so in a rage, the king of Israel tears his clothes, which is okay, I suppose, because he's got 10 sets of new ones, but that's beside the point. We're not sure if he tears his clothes simply as an act of rage or whether it is, as it would have been the Hebrew custom, whether he tears it in an act of grief. Whatever the reason, the king knows that the potential fallout from this outlandish request to just heal someone could be devastating for Israel if he doesn't comply. Anyway, Elisha the prophet hears the news and he hears the king's distress. And so he goes to the king and he says, hey, you shouldn't have torn your clothes because there's nothing to grieve about here. There's nothing to be angry about. I'll sort this out for you. Just tell Naaman to come to my house. So Naaman arrives at Elisha's house with all his horses and chariots. It's really Naaman and his blue light brigade. But, this is the big but of the story, but Elisha doesn't come out to greet Naaman personally. All he does is he sends out a messenger. And the message is simple. Go, wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored and you shall be clean. But instead of excitement, I mean, this is why he came. These are the words he longed to hear. This is why he traveled. Naaman, instead of being excited, is instead deeply offended because Elisha didn't come out to greet him. So we read in the scripture, Naaman became angry and went away saying, I thought that for me, For me, he would surely come out and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and would wave his hand over the spot and cure the skin disease. And he goes on almost on a different track. He says, Are not Abana and Farpar the rivers of Damascus better, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not go and wash in them and be clean? And he turned and went away in a rage. Just one thing stands in the way of Naaman's healing, of his complete healing, just one thing. It's of course himself. He believed the word of a young girl he had kidnapped and enslaved. It's quite a leap that. He was willing to travel and look for the prophet. It's quite a big deed that. But things deteriorate, things go pear-shaped, things go off the rails when Elisha doesn't come out to greet Naaman and sends a messenger instead. Naaman expects, Naaman wants to see the main man because he's a big shot and big shots deserve to see the main man. And once his indignant rage has begun, it's hard to stop. It's like it picks up momentum. And he goes, why won't the main man just come outside and wave his hand around? Because I expect God on demand as well. Even God should do what I want, when I want, and how I want it. Because what I want matters more than anything else in all creation. And he doesn't stop there. He's on a roll now. And he says, and by the way, if I do have to go and wash in a river, why does it have to be an Israelite one? Because your rivers are inferior to ours. Our rivers are better than yours. You can almost hear the childish na 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 and he storms off in a rage. It's the word, I, I find that he storms off. If it was theater, he'd be walking off the stage, gone. 
This is extraordinary. Can you sense it? It's extraordinary. Naaman is willing to give up a lifetime of healing. And think about this is what this is what that means. It means he's willing to settle for suffering. He's willing to settle for a shorter life and isolation from family, friends, and society, all just so he can keep his ego intact. All because his ego can't take it. He chooses death over life. And yet as absurd, this is the genius of the thing, as absurd as name and story might seem, as bizarre as it might seem, it is in fact, to us, if we are honest, it is in fact entirely familiar. Because through the story, you and I are looking straight into a mirror. Our world swims in self-centeredness and arrogance. Thomas Merton, I think, would call it to say we are embedded in it. The Apostle John calls it the pride of life, the pride of life. And we are all partakers of it. It's in us all, maybe to a greater and lesser degree, but it's in us all. Here are a few examples. See if you recognize them. There's the arrogance of entitlement. This attitude of the world owes me. I think our world is awash in a spirit of entitlement at the moment. And I'm amazed at how quickly we become entitled as human beings. The world owes me. There's the arrogance of control. From our personal, private efforts to try and control one another to some of, and I want to be clear, it's only some of, but some of those ridiculous COVID regulations that we had to observe, all the way to the complexity of issues like abortion and the rights of women and their bodies, you'll find human beings obsessed, really obsessed with exerting power over others, of wanting to control one another. It's the arrogance that we can hold towards one another. Of course, we know well the arrogance of religion. The Christian church has this terrible history of using God to shame and to manipulate and to control and to oppress people, all kinds of people over the centuries. And in all of those instances, it's never actually about God. It's always about human beings trying to exert control and power over others. It's arrogance. We know only too well at the moment across the world the arrogance of exceptionalism. Uh, what I mean by that is there are nations and cultures and families and individuals who believe that they are in one way or another superior to others. And it's this arrogance of exceptionalism that causes wars and racism and nationalism and sexism and homophobia and even poverty. They all find their roots in the basic understanding or the basic belief that I am better than you. Exceptionalism. And then I wasn't sure what to call this one, but I hope you'll be with me in it. I've just called it, it's almost, it's almost a redundancy, but the arrogance of self-centeredness. And this is, if you like, the most gentle of the arrogances. Because, it, and I say gentle, not that it is without impact, but it's because it's the quiet one whose focus is to ensure that I'm okay. Which, by the way, is not a bad thing. I think it is right that we all have self-care, that we look after ourselves. The problem is not that I look after myself. The problem is that some of us look after ourselves, even if it is at the expense of others. So, so this quiet arrogance of self-centeredness says, I'm looking after myself and I don't care what impact that has on others. It may be the quiet one, but it's the common one. It's the one we encounter every day in every one we meet. It is the pride of life of which we are all partakers. But we need to get back to our story quickly. So then, here, here is Naaman, um, protesting, stormed off the stage in anger. But then a miracle happens in Naaman's life, and it's not the one you think. It's not the one you think. It's this one. These words, his servants approached and said to him. That's the miracle. His servants approached. 
the rest of the magnificent story uh, is really the fruit of this miracle of the servants approaching and that fruit is wonderful and we'll talk about the fruit not only today but again next week it's wonderful but the real miracle is the servants approached and they say to him listen to the language they say to him father interesting word hey father if the prophet had commanded you to do something difficult would you not have done it now how much more when all he said to you was wash and be clean we know nothing of these particular servants maybe they too like that young girl last week maybe they were captured in one of Naaman's wars I wonder if that word father is a subservient word is a courtesy a politeness or maybe it is that they have developed a relationship in that environment where it's an act of kindness he really has there's a benevolent father relationship there whatever it is it's the servants again in the story who ensure that their master finds healing notice this it's the humble ones which like grace lead name and home it's the humble ones who lead him home because it's only ever grace it's only ever grace that leads any of us home. This is the miracle. This is the miracle that in his rage, grace finds him. This is the miracle that in his rage, grace finds him. The rest of the story is fruit. Joan Chittister says if the preservation of the globe in the 21st century requires anything of the past at all it may well be the commitment to humility when we make ourselves god no one in the world is safe in our presence when we make ourselves god listen to the phrase no one in the world is safe in our presence We'll need to talk about what humility is on another day. But what we can say today is this, that arrogance and pride will always, always lead to death. It, it's more than just an unattractive character trait in someone. It is the kiss of death. And we will discover in and through our own lives, and many of us have discovered, seen it, we've got testimonies to it, we will discover that humility, even if it's the long path, humility always leads to life. Always leads to life. Can we let Naaman have the last word for us today? So he went down, finally, he went down and immersed himself seven times in the Jordan. A nice ritual washing. According to the word of the man of God, an obedience to God's word and then his flesh was restored like the flesh of a young boy and he was clean then he returned to the man of God he and all his company which would mean the servants too and he came and stood before them and said now I know now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. God be with you. Thanks for being with us.